All right, hello, Timberwolves Daily YouTube channel. Last video podcast recording before the Timberwolves season actually begins tomorrow night. And I've got Jack Borman on, Canis Hoopas site runner, and we are going to be partnering up this season. I'll be working with Canis Hoopas with Jack Borman. Kind of a, <coughs> dropped my phone there. But a weekly episode, weekly blog with Jack here and then recapping it on the site. Me and Jack have known each other for a while. I enjoy working with him, so get a partner up, work together. Jack, happy to have you. Wolves play tomorrow. How you doing? I'm good, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be be coming on every week here. I always in uh, always enjoy our conversations, and, and I'm gonna be gonna be really excited to have have some of your content on our site. Um, should be a lot of fun, and, and Wolves fans obviously that, that follow Canis too. Like, we'll we'll be boosting all, all of Cooper's stuff. So um, so every time he, he has a video go out, you know, we'll obviously post that on on social and and make sure that that that's getting out to to as many Wolves fans as possible. So. Uh, so it should be a ton of fun and, and really excited to uh, to get this thing going today with, with the season starting tomorrow. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. I mean, yeah, season, it crept up. Obviously, we went through preseason, the offseason. It's been a while, had some of the biggest news in Wolves history, and it's all going to finally come in tomorrow night. It's going to be good. We finally saw the starting five play together. It wasn't, it didn't, I mean, it was going into the game. I was super excited, like big smile on my face. Here we go. And then it was just a big disaster is it are you concerned at all like about seeing that i mean obviously it's not going to click right away but that was just nothing obviously the first time they played together but you watching that game you sitting here now what were your impressions of the starting five what do you think of the whole thing um i mean my impressions of the starting five was basically just like it's very evident that they have played very little structured basketball together um and obviously that's that's understandable you know the timberwolves have really tried to uh, to keep down Rudy Gobert's activity, both in practice and in games, um, just because he played a ton of basketball in a, in a more grueling physical setting in Eurobasket over the summer um, and probably played in what, like 10 or 15 games. The French national team was in practice, um, you know, pretty much from the moment after he was in town for, for that uh, that introductory press conference, maybe the first week of July. Um, I mean, pretty much all the rest of July, August and September, he was in Eurobasket mode and then came over here. So uh, and then obviously Carl uh, had that throat infection um, that, that, you know, I think it was Brian Windhorst that reported that um, you know, lost a bunch of weight. Um, you know, it's just not stuff I'm concerned about. Um, you know, I, I think it was honestly probably a good thing that the Wolves kind of got a stinker on film Uh in the preseason, uh, especially against a, a really talented offensive team in, in the Nets, you know, space the floor really, really well. And, and are probably going to be one of the, the style of teams that I think the Wolves will struggle to defend just because they have two guys that are so, so good scoring in the mid range off the pick and roll. So they're, the, the Wolves defensive positioning is going to have to be really good against a team like that. And it just wasn't the, the cohesion wasn't there. Um, you know, and we, and we can kind of get into a, a few different things about it, but, um, I, I'm honestly not concerned about the offense, especially, um, just because I think Carl Anthony Towns is going to be the guy that unlocks this for everybody. A lot of people would think it would be d but I think it's going to be Cat, in my opinion, um, just because of the way that, that his skills kind of bridge together every other player's best skills. Um, and I wrote about that in, in the recap that I had for that preseason game. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm more concerned about the defense clicking right away. But, again, like, if anybody wants to go look at the Wolves – schedule their first eight games they get oklahoma city twice utah the spurs three times and the lakers in minneapolis so i mean it's just a mickey mouse schedule <laughs> to start and like i think it's a good thing that they lost a preseason game as opposed to you know losing a game against one of those opponents and and rather uh i don't know just explosive yeah. fashion <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the pre they had a chance to go undefeated in the preseason, so, you know, whatever, I guess, didn't do it. No, doesn't matter at all. I don't care about wins and losses in the preseason. Sure, it's a small indicator, but it's all about player performance, what they look like on the court, and all that. But, yeah, it was very clunky, didn't look great, but they come in facing a super easy schedule. A lot of people look at it as, would you rather get them later on in the season when they're all tanking, or right now when, you know, you're trying to just mesh the team together rather than facing good or even average teams or even slightly below average teams like these are the worst of the worst the wolves are playing right away i think that's a good thing seeing as how so they I. are just not meshing at all the wolves and i think the talent will just overcome i think they will beat the thunder i think they will beat the spurs but a lot of people think there could be some fumble into the bag early on here for the wolves 
not quite closing out on these games just because the cohesion isn't there. But the talent is there. They've still got Town, still got Gobert, Edwards deal. Like, they're going to figure it out enough, I think, to win, I don't know, six of the first eight. Yeah. Like, and Yeah. And I mean, think about it this way, too. Like, even last year, if one of D'Lo, Ant, or Cat didn't have a good game, it was just so much harder to overcome that. Um, but now, you know, with Gobert in the mix, you get, you know, just another star player that you're able to, to have be able to step up if one of the other guys don't have it that day. Um, and, and that's the other thing, too, with the bench is I think last year, if a bench guy didn't have it, a key bench guy, it was a lot harder for the Wolves to just plug and play and be like, all right, uh, you know, Kyle Anderson doesn't have tonight. Let's play moratorium Prince or vice versa. Or, you know, we can go to Bryn Forbes if Jalen Noel's not making shots. Or, um, you know, if, if Jordan McLaughlin, you know, for whatever reason, he's like the most reliable guy ever. But if he's not having a good night, you know, maybe we can we can try to get Austin Rivers in there as like a, you know, more scoring at the backup point guard spot. So I think, you know, the Wolves are just so deep that they're more – you know, ready, readily able to just, you know, cover up any gaps that may happen just on that night and still overcome that and, and win a game uh, just with their depth. And I think we saw, that's what we saw in the preseason too. Um, and that was what was really encouraging about those first four preseason games, especially. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm really not concerned about, about that performance leading into to the start of this right. season. Cause I think we're going to see some pretty egregious tanking and, and stuff like SGA might, might even be on a minutes restriction coming off yeah. of his knee injury. And um, I mean, that team is just terrible. I think they're going to start <laughs> their starting center might be six, eight, maybe six, nine uh, in that game. And then you think about the Spurs. I mean, cat dropped 60 on Jakob Pertle last year. Uh, so they get them three times uh, the jazz. I mean, the jazz are probably the friskiest of those teams just because they have the most competent NBA players. They might just um, make 15 threes on you and it, they might all be Malik Beasley. Like, <laughs> but even then, like Walker Kessler might start at center. Like right. we just have no idea what, what that's going to look like. Um, and, and then obviously the Lakers, I mean, the Lakers are a dumpster fire. I mean, I just, and who knows if Anthony Davis is already going to be injured. Um, Russell Westbrook apparently has a, like a hamstring thing he's going through or a groin or something. So I mean, it, we're. Just, I mean, it's just the best possible on ramp that you could have for this this team to kind of find its footing. You know, obviously they'll have some some good practice time. Most of those games are in Minneapolis, so you have limited travel, plenty of time to recover, get these guys acclimated. Um, and they've had three days of practice in a row: um, Sunday, Monday, and, and today. So it's obviously obviously a good sign. Um, but I would be shocked if the Wolves lost any of the six games that they have against those teams in the first little bit of stretch here. Classic kiss of death there from Jack Borman. But it, I'm totally with you. Like, it's hard to lose these games. And I get it. You know, you want to play them at, at the end of the season when they're trying to lose, but they, they're they just going to lose. Like, they're not, they're not good. A lot was made of SGA playing. Like, uh-oh, here comes the Thunder. It doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter. They're just not good. They're not good. The Wolves, again, so much talent. Will it click right away? I don't know. Probably even if it, not. But... Even if it doesn't, it, right. I don't think it matters. Like Exactly, it, exactly. Yeah. It's strange. But yeah, I mean, with the whole not clicking right away, there are some concerns going into this first game, into this first stretch. First thing that was just, you know, the weight and size charts all came out today for the Wolves. And it was made a big deal that Anthony Edwards, I think, is 239 and Katz 238. One pound under Anthony Edwards, the starting shooting guard. Power forward is under him. Bit strange, but we all know Cat was dealing with the, the rough sickness, was in the hospital for a while. Anthony Edwards spent the offseason bulking up. Cat's trying to get back up there. But of course, looking at the weight charts now, it's a it's it's a weird thing. Carl Anthony Towns being lower than Anthony Edwards. What lot of ways you could look at this. How do you interpret it? Man, um I, I just feel bad for Cat, man. Um, you know, really anticipated season for him. Obviously he can't control getting, you know, uh, getting sick like he did um you know he's obviously he's you know think about carl he's going to do everything in his power to make sure that, that he's going to be in in peak physical condition for this team um you know he's he was in phenomenal shape for for most of last season um looked incredible um and and he's one of he's arguably one of the most consistent guys in the nba just plays his ass off every night for his teammates and he's done that throughout you know his whole entire career um and so i, I just feel badly for carl as a dude um 
because I he he totally deserves the opportunity to be at his peak physical condition and play alongside the best teammates that he's ever had. Um, and just given all the all the stuff that he's gone through on the basketball floor. Um, but I, I am concerned about it. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is like Carl's still on this, you know, kind of ticking up where, you know, all the different beat guys have reported that, you know, he said he's, he's been trying to eat all this food and he just can't do it. And he's got to work his way back yeah. up there. Um, and any of us that have, have had a prolonged sickness kind of understand what that is. Um, and you can't just go from, from zero to 60 uh, right away. Um, but I'm concerned about it in the sense that I think Carl could get knocked off of his spot on the drive more easily. And it could kind of lead him to flop more than he needs to. And if he's flopping more than he needs to, he's on the ground more. We've seen the wrist injuries uh, with him not knowing how to protect himself falling. Um, I'm really not that concerned from like a defensive perspective. Um, you know, I, I think they're going to play a more def- or more aggressive defensive scheme when he's on the floor. You know, Mike Nori said that um, in practice a couple of weeks ago that they're going to kind of switch back and forth in a drop when Rudy's mm-hmm. out there and a, and a high wall scheme when Carl's out there. Um, and I just don't really see that being a, more an issue in the high wall scheme. Like he's just not going to get posted up a whole lot. Even if he does, um, you know, he'll have solid guys like Kyle Anderson or Jane McDaniels to rotate around and help him out even to start out the season. But but Carl said, too, that, like, he didn't want to be this light, obviously. And he said half of it was slimming down because that was the plan. And the other half of it was, you know, this sickness. So I, I'd say we'd see Carl probably tick up closer to, like, 247 in, the, in between 245 and 250, I think, is kind of where he wants to be. Um I think we'll get there when we get there. I just don't know. But until then, those are, those are kind of the concerns that, that I have. Yeah. I mean, it'd be, it's the Rudy Gobert cleans up all problems thing. If he wasn't the starting center and cat was still the starting center on this team, I would be more concerned, but cat moving to power forward. Absolutely a big bonus here. Like if this happened and cat was the center, big, big concern with him, not just being nearly as big as he well not nearly, but just as big as he was in the past, but Rudy Gobert down there, cat playing along the wings, hoping to take more threes, you know, just opening up his offense a lot more defensively, not being the rim protector, not being down low against the other huge guys in the league. I think that alone takes a lot of the weight off his shoulders, no pun intended, but uh, (laughs) yeah, I mean, that's going to help a lot, just not being the center and Rudy Gobert, again, just the going back to cleaning up all the messes on his own, like he did in Utah, just with teams that weren't as good as this Wolves team, so... I think Rudy helps a lot just even in this situation, but it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Cat obviously playing a whole new position, at least on the offensive end for the most part, and yeah, we'll see. Weight challenges plus switching positions could present some issues, probably will early on, but not concerned. Yeah. Like you said, yeah, I think I th- he unlocks everything. I honestly think, too, another thing that I have a little bit of an issue with is just like his speed. I think that you know it's just going to take him a little bit to, to get into game playing shape. And, and we're, you know, we're able to see him go at full speed on, on almost every single possession. Um, I, I think that that that's something that may take a little bit too. Um, and who knows, like I would, I would much rather see Carl play 25 minutes going 110% than 35 minutes where he goes 110% for maybe 17, 18 minutes. And the other 17, 18, he's kind of passive or just doesn't have the juice to be out there the whole time. Um, you know, it was really encouraging that he was able to tick up into the 30s uh, in minutes on this last game against the Nets. But, um, but you know, like when you have a guy like Rudy Gobert and Kyle Anderson who can play the five, um, we saw it in the in the Memphis series against Cat. Um, you know, he can do that. It, I, I think the Wolves just have to really do its best for Carl's body um, and, and make sure that that they're doing that. But but obviously, you know, that's what that's what you got your medical staff for. So. It'll be interesting to see what that plan looks like uh, come tomorrow night. Yeah, and they're always going to be, you know, it wasn't always going to be perfect. Obviously, coming in this offseason, it was looked at, you know, the Wolves, perfect team. But every team has their small issues, and the Wolves are right there with them. Another player I wanted to chat about and some slight news about him, D'Angelo Russell, obviously contract year this season for D'Lo. Wolves probably going to need him for the future. He's looked at as a great fit around Rudy Gobert. We haven't seen a ton of that yet in the limited action. It has looked, you know, pretty solid. Obviously it'll get better as the season goes along, 
But the wolves are apparently not reciprocating calls or talks for an extension with D'Angelo Russell's uh, his team right now. That's what Brian Windhorst, uh, Darren Doogie Wolfson reported on the recent Scoop podcast. And that's just, I mean, it's interesting. Obviously, extension talks, we were thinking D'Lo might get extended earlier in the offseason, might get traded, but now it's just looking like he's going into a contract year. Maybe it happens in season, who knows. But overall, D'Angelo Russell... Really big year, set up for a career year, type of career year at least. And we'll see. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. But yeah, more so just D'Angelo Russell. I was way out on him at the beginning of the offseason because I just didn't see the, the fits after the playoffs. I mean, I was sour taste in my mouth. How could I not? But right now, I mean, I'm all in on the fit with Gobert, the fit with his offense, him just as a pass-first point guard. I don't know, where are you standing right now with D'Angelo Russell's fit on this team, and do you wish there was a bit more extension talks? Um, you know, I don't really think that I, I have, like, a a stance on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that, that they haven't been having these talks. Um, you know, I, I think that from the Wolves' perspective, this is very clearly they're treating it kind of like a restricted free agency situation where, you know, they, they obviously don't want to spend more money than they have to. Uh, they don't want, I mean, obviously Tim Connolly too was involved with that, that Michael Porter Jr. Uh, extension where they gave him the full five-year max extension a year before they had to. Um, and obviously he missed all of last year with, with that injury and or most of last season with that injury. And, and that outlook of that contract just does not look very good right now. Um, and I think this is probably a situation where, you know, if everything goes really well this season, I think it would be hard for um, both sides to not want to continue this partnership beyond this season. Um, but who knows? Maybe D'Angelo Russell is is you know primarily interested in just taking the best offer he can get, and that's his money. And I don't think that's any of our place to say that's a a good decision or a bad decision. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean. You know, personally, I, I would like to be able to see a core for the Wolves kind of stick together long term and, and make it work. And obviously, you know, D'Angelo Russell was a huge part of the Timberwolves success last season in the regular season. I don't I don't think it's fair to let the playoff performance overshadow that right. just because they wouldn't have sniffed the position that they were in. Um, had it not been for D'Lo, he made some huge shots in the play in game uh, was was largely fantastic in that game. Um, so. I, it, it's a, it just just it just does not surprise me um, that that there haven't been extension talks. I don't think they want it to be a you know something that can affect play. I think both sides probably just said you know what like see how this season plays out. We'll revisit this um, and and go from there. Yeah, and I don't think it's like you mentioned. I don't think it's going to affect team chemistry or play on the court at all. I don't think D'Lo is going to come in with a you know bad taste in his mouth from just not being reciprocated in this. I think he knows he's probably going to have a really, really solid year if he avoids injury for the most part. We've seen what he can do alongside a big, playing with Ru like a big similar to Rudy Gobert here. Obviously, the cat D'Lo pairing never was really maximized, but with Gobert here, the pick and roll, he's set up, again, for a career type of year. He's got guys around him, Ant, Jaden, Cat, that he can just he can average 10 assists per game, average 17, 18 but points per game still. I'm intrigued by the whole thing. I know he is too, like, how can he not be? So I don't think he is, I mean, I, he, I think he's probably ecstatic about entering free agency after this year instead yeah, of I mean, I, an extension. Yeah. I don't think that you could create an environment that's more friendly to D'Angelo Russell and more kind of conducive to him having a successful season than the one that he's in right now and that he's got so many weapons at his disposal. He'll be able to have that mid-range jump shot uh, as much as he wants really coming off of off of Gobert uh, screens and dribble handoffs. Um, he was also really, really good off the ball in that, in that last preseason game too. Um, and, and a word that, that he, you know, he told all of us in the locker room after that game uh, on Friday was balanced and that he just wants to have a really balanced game this season and be able to, you know, to impact the game on the ball, off the ball, whatever the team needs and making sure that, you know, that everybody's firing it on all cylinders as much as possible, whether that's, you know, Ant having the ball in his hands, Carl cutting off the ball or spotting up for three, Rudy throwing down lobs. He just wants everything to be as balanced as possible. And, I, and I'm, I'm excited to see, um, you know, how that plays out for, for D-Lo this season. Yeah, I mean, again, contract year. He's 
It's not a concern to me. I don't think it's a concern for him. He's going to come in, play his ass off, and probably get $30 million plus after this season. So good for him. It's going to be fun to see how it all plays out. But also, speaking, oh also, yeah, also new dad effect, too. We, we got to keep that in mind okay? as we start these, these first few games. So I don't, that'll be a storyline to follow. <laughs> Absolutely. Congrats on D'Lo, the new child. But speaking of contract years, someone that I didn't put in our notes, which I often don't even follow, but Jalen Noel is also in a contract year, someone I wanted to talk about. Extension talks have gone from like three for nine or uh, three years, nine mil to then four years, 13 mil. Those numbers from Darren Wolfson as well. Um, Jalen Noel and his camp kind of declining both. He's also betting on himself. He looks at himself as kind of this Sixth man off the bench. Chris Finch referred to him as the X Factor off the bench. Jalen Noel coming into a big year himself has never had a solidified role on this team. He's gone game stretches of like 15 games where he's just playing lights out. Then he's just out of the rotation. A lot of defensive issues there that have kept him out for the most part. Offensively, we know what Jalen Noel brings. I still am not convinced that he's going to have the role many of us are convinced he is just because... We haven't seen it. I mean, obviously, Beverly's gone. Beasley's gone. bomaro has gone. A lot of guys are out of here. But they brought in Forbes. Forbes is apparently shooting lights out in practice. We saw what he was doing in the preseason. Rivers, I'm not impressed by, but he's still a veteran on the team. There's guys here that are going to get in the way. And just Jalen Noel, I don't know what to expect. I mean, are you expecting... He's going to get a more sizable role, but just... Are you convinced it's the size that a lot of Wolves fans have kind of convinced themselves Noel will be playing this year. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. And I, I think, I, you know, I tend to side more with the fans on this one um, in that I think that Jalen Noel brings something that the team really needs off the bench. Um, you know, you already have kind of a pure point guard, get everybody involved type of guy in, in Jordan McLaughlin. But outside of, outside of that, like there aren't many guys off the Timberwolves bench that can create their own shots. Um, You know, Bryn Forbes is, is going to be a guy who's going to be used in dribble handoff action a lot and could, you know, take a couple of dribbles in the mid range and and hit wide open jump shots, which we've seen playing off of go bear. But they really need Noel because he's just a guy who can go get you a bucket. And it would not surprise me if, if Noel ends up being in some closing lineups too, um, depending on who the opponent is, um, because Noel is he's already one of the most efficient isolation scorers in the entire NBA. Um, and, right. and that's something that that is so valuable. I don't care who's on your team. But then when you also factor in the context of the only – you know, two other real isolation guys I trust on the Wolves to, to go get a bucket and score are Anthony Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns. Carl Anthony Towns was also north of the 95th percentile in isolation efficiency last season. I think he might have even been in the top five overall players in isolation efficiency last season, according to Synergy. Um, and, and those are just guys that you need in your rotation. Um, I think with Gobert out there, you have to hope that that some of those defensive concerns will be masked at least a little bit. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, I struggle to see how he doesn't get at least 20 minutes a night. Um, I think Forbes will play a decent amount just because they need a shooter out there. Um, but again, it's just a looking at, it's just looking at what skills do you need on the floor and who can provide them. And there's so few guys that can create their own shot and score. Um, uh, and Noel's proven that he can do that in the preseason. He's proven he can do it efficiently. Um, and he's proven that he can do so without turning the ball over, which is which is obviously huge for someone like Chris Finch. So, um, And obviously some of the defensive concerns have kept him off the floor the last few years. But again, like Finch, Finch seems like a very straight shooter to me. I don't think that he would go out of his way to pump up somebody's tires and then, you know, take the air out of all of them when it comes to actually playing the games. So... Um, I'd say at least initially, uh, I'd side more with the fans, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that'll last a whole entire season. If he really struggles, like, I, I, I don't think it's like a guaranteed set in stone. Here's your role. Mm-hmm. This is going to be your role the entire season. But I do feel pretty confidently that, that that's what it'll be to start the season. And even if there are a few growing pains, they'll, they'll for sure let him try to play through that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of with, you. I think he'll start out. I think he'll start out in a nice role. I'm not convinced it'll stick like that. I think he's on a, not a short leash, but one that if he plays poor, if defensively it doesn't look good, 
his role could be lessened and more guys could be given an opportunity because again this is a team with extremely high i mean expectations who do you, for who do you think would get a get an opportunity if if noel was kind of knocked down the pecking order a little bit i i mean i really wasn't impressed with austin rivers in preseason but i think just the overall the defense that he brings and his lack of shooting his inability to want to shoot in the preseason really scared me that was my biggest takeaway for him just he'd be open from three and just not shoot ever and everyone was like well he shoots 35 percent it's like he just doesn't do it though so i don't know i just pumped up his tires only just shit on austin rivers but (laughs) (laughs) it's just there's players here they sign players in the offseason that can step up again i know forbes is going to play but he's the 11th or 12th man right now it seems so maybe they bump up his minutes a bit. I feel like I'm forgetting someone, but I don't know. Like, Noel right now is like the sixth or seventh guy. I could see him be bumped down to eighth or ninth. I don't want him to be. I'm a big Jalen Noel fan. I would have liked for them to lock him de- lock him in on like four for 13, but Noel but again, himself. V- yeah. Very, very smart by by the Noel camp to oh, not 100%, do that. Oh, yeah. 100%, um, yeah. You know, I think... I think if Jalen Noel plays how he's capable of playing, I think he could end up signing a contract north of like four for 60. Um, but we'll have Lee to see. Beasley contract. Yeah. I mean, we'll have to see it just, again, it all, the, the, the range of outcomes for his season, I think are so yeah. wa- far reaching and, and vast that, that it's really kind of a tough, tough thing to project and analyze at this stage. Yeah. But it, it's not like they've just got, random guys at the end of their... It's not like they've just got Jake Layman's at the end of their bench, right? No offense. The rookies they drafted, I don't think are going to get any run to start the season or even in the middle, but, like, they're not just bad players. Preseason, I was not impressed by really either of them, but, I mean, Wendell Moore could develop into a nice two-way player that is the seventh or eighth guy on a good team. My not, I'm not sure. Like, he brings the athleticism. He brings more just kind of flashy play, but we'll see what he develops into. But there's there's guys on this team that could step up. I mean, Eric Pascal even is like the 15th or 16th guy on this team. Like, they've got guys. It's not just a bunch of fill-ins at the end of the roster. So if things go poorly for really any of the first five bench players, there are guys that can step in. We'll see how it goes. But, I mean, the depth is there. We've been talking about the depth all offseason. Let's start playing games here soon. But, yeah, I mean, I'm excited. Should be interesting. But anything else you want to say on Noel? Otherwise, we'll move along here. Let's keep it moving. All right. Last big topic is just overall NBA outlook on the Wolves this year is that they're around the 11th or 12th best team in the league. Through the I went through five power rankings at ESPN, Sports Illustrated, CBS, Bleacher Report, and one more. I don't know. It evened out to 11.8 overall on the power rankings for like the main five sites that I checked. The Wolves kind of coming into the season, it seems like they may have three top 25 players, but... A lot of people just don't like the overall team. They're kind of sour on the Gobert trade, sour on Gobert Towns overall. Wolves not looked at as a top 10 team entering the season. I mean, it's just an interesting look at where they're viewed right now. Week one power rankings after this team plays the Thunder and the Spurs and, you know, the other high school teams they'll be facing to start could bump them up a little. But just looking at the power rankings, were you a bit surprised Wolves aren't a top 10 team or is that about what you expected? Um, I guess it's kind of what I've, what I expected. Um, do I think that that's like where they should be? No. Um, but you know, small market team team's been terrible forever. You know, it doesn't surprise me that they're not getting the same respect as, you know, a team like the Grizzlies who beat them in the playoffs last season, even though I think the Grizzlies got markedly worse this off season. Um, and I think that's kind of the general consensus on the Grizzlies. Um, I think that them winning 56 games last year with Ja missing as much as he did and JJJ missing as much as he did was pretty incredible. Um, but I think it would be hard to project that they repeat uh, as good of a season as they had last year. Um, and then obviously, you know, Denver, that's another team that, that figures to be in front of them. Um, as far as the West goes, obviously you know, the Clippers are going to be good. The Suns still have relatively the same team. Um, I just think some teams in the Eastern conference are getting a little too much love relative to the wolves. Um, you know, I think a, a team like the Cavs. I, I think the Cavs are kind of like the wolves, except they're just not there yet. Like, I think a lot of people, are really tantalized by the uh, potential of a guy like Evan Mobley. And I, and for, 
for obviously very valid reasons, but he's he's not that great of a player yet. He's not he's not Carl Anthony Towns, right? Carl Anthony Towns, way better player than Evan Mobley is right now. Rudy Gobert, way better player than Jared Allen is right now. Anthony Edwards, uh, I, I way I, better than. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know that that you can really say Donovan Mitchell is really that much right. better than Anthony Edwards. Donovan Mitchell is one of the worst defensive players in the league. Um, Anthony Edwards is not one of the worst defensive players in the league. I think Darius Garland is much better than D'Angelo Russell is right now. Um, then again, you look at the you look at the three spot. I mean, the Cavs, you know, probably could start a guy like Karis Levert or Isaac Okoro. Um, I'd rather have Jaden McDaniels than both of those players, but I know obviously we're, we're biased here, but um, yeah, I, I just think the outlook for, for the Wolves relative to, to teams like the Mavs or the Raptors or the Cavs, um, some teams like that, that, that might slot in ahead of, ahead of the Wolves um, is a little, is a little suspect, but, um, but other than that, like, I'm not super surprised at this stage. I just think it's going to be funny that no one looks at the start of their schedule and then in a week or two weeks yeah. when the Wolves are 5-0 and or 6-0, yeah. and o, they're like, oh, where did this come from? You know, we had them at 14, and now we have them at 7. It's just like it, – it's 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 all predictable, so it's not – Right. It doesn't move me that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I figured I'd bring it up just because it's the topic right now, and we haven't had any basketball in <laughs> a while, but I'm excited for games. I'm with you for the most part. I mean, really all of it. I think the Wolves are at least – should be top 10 here the talent at least should just bring them up there like again we all talk about the three top 25 plus d low like the talent alone it's what people look at i don't see how it doesn't put the wolves top 10 super just baseline observations there but it's just yeah people look at pretty much one thing power rankings before the season it's the roster the wolves roster is loaded so we'll see i think they're a top 10 team and last thing i want to ask you first time we chatted after the go bear trade I said, what are your expectations? And you said one seed. And that hit me like a truck back then because you were the first person to say it. And I'm wondering, are your expectations for this team still one seed? Yeah, that's the expectation for me. Um, This team has more than enough talent to be able to be the one seed. They have an incredibly deep bench. I think the only team that has a deeper bench than them in the Western Conference is the Los Angeles Clippers. Um, I think if World War III started right now and all the militaries of the world went to battle, I think the Los Angeles Clippers would win. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the Warriors obviously are, are going to are going to be there in the end. Um, you know, they're, they're, a, they're a really strong team. They, they're, they're battle tested. But at the end of the day, like they're, they're going to rest guys. They're, they're not yeah. going to they're not going to be gunning for the one seed. I think they understand that they don't need to be the one seed to, to win a title. Um, and they're, and they're not going to gun for the one seed at the expense of being healthy and ready to go for the playoffs. I, I think you can say the same thing with the Clippers, like Kawhi's won a title. Um, he, he gets it. Um, obviously they, they have a lot to prove together. Um, so then you're really looking at teams like the Suns, the Nuggets and, and the Timberwolves, honestly, I, I think are the next three teams that would, would probably be in position to, to gun for that spot. I think you have a lot of health concerns with the Nuggets. Um, I think the Nuggets got a lot better this offseason, and that's not just because MPJ and and Jamal Murray will be back. I, I really liked their additions of Bruce Brown and, and Contavious Caldwell Pope um, on the wing. I think those will be big helps for them just because Will Barton did not cut it last season, um, and, and they'll have a lot more spacing and lineup flexibility this year. Um, and and with the Suns, like I just think that's like a – that's just like a bad vibe situation yeah, who knows where I think the team. chemistry, it's just going to be tough for them to be locked in and stay really together for a whole entire season. Um, I think DeAndre Ayton's going to request a trade from Phoenix the second he's able to. Um, you know, that was big Monday morning showing up to the meeting being like, hey, I'm here. I'm getting paid. I guess I'll do my job, but I really don't <laughs> want to be here type of thing. And, you know, I think the Wolves are just a really hungry team relative to to the suns so i i think it's going to come down to the nuggets and the timberwolves and for me personally i expect the timberwolves to be healthier than the nuggets um and i expect the timberwolves to really take advantage of having one of the easiest schedules if not the easiest schedule in the entire nba um and something to keep in mind is like the wolves play the nuggets three times this season when the nuggets are on a back-to-back or on night two of a back-to-back so um, that, that could be something to monitor just for, for playoff positioning purposes here. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think that's still my expectation of the Wolves. Um, and maybe I'm holding them to a higher standard than, than they're holding themselves to, but, but they I have, don't think so. Yeah. They have the talent to do it. And, um, and I hope that that's the, the expectation for everybody in, inside that locker room. I mean, it's a very, I mean, seeing Rudy Gobert having done it with the jazz, like, it's not like this is some yeah. crazy thing. He's been Correct. the one seed. Correct. Exactly. Like they've been really good with Rudy Gobert on the jazz. This team is just better. You can't argue with me that this team, this team is not better than most of not all of those playoff jazz teams. Like, again, the talent is unbelievable. It's all just about can they make it work? Can they mesh? And I think so. I think, again, this Wolves team, the front office, the coaching, are so unbelievably bought in, so unbelievably excited for the chance of to have Rudy Gobert alongside these guys. They're going to make it work, and it's just, again, like, stereotypical but they're, they're kind of built for the regular season as far as we know go yeah. and cat are built for the regular season d low too like get to the playoffs figure it out from there but the regular season should be should be pretty successful man like yeah and uh, i th- yeah. and i think too like you 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 hit it like that collective buy-in i think really matters in the regular season whether or not that translates to the playoffs yeah. remains to be seen get there when we get there yeah yeah but but for the regular season i mean They've got a lot of stretches of really easy basketball. And I think, you know, based on what guys like Austin Rivers have, have told the media crew and, and what, you know, the beat reporters have reported, um, you know, especially Dane on, on his podcast, you know, he had a couple of great clips in there. And one he did with Kyle Taggy from, from Vegas about Austin Rivers talking about how, you know, he's going to be one of the guys that really makes sure that the collective buy-in is 100% there, that he's holding everybody accountable, that it doesn't matter if he's on the floor or on the bench, that he's going to be, loud in guys ears pumping guys up you know everything he can do to make sure that this team stays on course and um you know and the stuff like that matters i mean whether that's just like you know fruity media stuff um you know or rosy media stuff uh in the preseason or or what actually becomes you know reality remains to be seen obviously but but it's good that you have guys like that in the locker room and yeah and something too that i want to point out about like these those utah teams is is like james hansen and the guys from slc dunk the the uh, sb nation affiliate for the jazz have talked to have really been critical of of quinn snyder and his uh you know outright refusal to change um any type of defensive schemes excuse me or change the rotations in the playoffs um and obviously they were successful with that in the regular season, but, but you have to, you have to think too about the coaching element of this. Right. Like yep. Chris Finch is, is really respected in that locker room and around the league too. Um, and it, and it's trying to be, you know, pretty revolutionary with, with changing schemes based on who's playing the five and, um, and mixing and matching lineups a bunch and staggering towns and go bear and then bringing them together. I mean, there, there's just a lot of moving pieces and, and I think the potential for, for Finch to be able to string all of those together and, and paint the best picture of, of Wolves basketball is going to be a fun storyline to watch, but also one that I think should inspire confidence uh, in, in this team and in, in the fans who are following this team as well. So, um, again, like I think that's my expectation that they're the one seed. Um, I would say the biggest reason why they wouldn't end up being the number one seed at the end of the season would probably be health um, or just not taking – you know, certain games seriously enough, like taking a, yeah, I don't know, a January game against like the Pacers or the, the Timberwolves Hornets tax seriously in a way, enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but again, like some of the signs that we've, we've spoken about here point to, to, you know, the team really being passionate about avoiding right, exactly. that. Um, so, you know, at this point it's all just talk. Um, but, but it, it sure will be fun to, to see that, uh, see that team walk the walk. It, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of talk, all talk, so much, so much talk that I've been doing. It's like, I'm excited for real NBA games. It's going to be great to see. Beyond excited, but yeah. Uh, live after every single game here on this channel. going to be a lot of fun. Big things coming. Going to be going to be great. This channel, excited to partner with Jack, Canis Hoopus. Used to write on there a bit, but writing is just not my thing. So now I'm doing video stuff for them, and I couldn't be happier to do it. Jack, thanks a ton, man. Excited to talk throughout the season every single week. Yeah, man, super excited to have you um, on board, Ken. It's gonna be gonna be a fun ride, great season, and um, and I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to our weekly chats. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. All right.